Welcome back to another episode of the Six Ps podcast. And today we're going back to Dungata. We're going to read through or have a guided reading of chapters three and four of Rosalie Ham's The Dressmaker. In terms of our areas of comparison, when we look to compare the dressmaker with the crucible, today we're going to be having a look at a couple. They are into the communities, blame and guilt, gender roles, and the abuse of power. And we'll try and make some connections with the crucible uh, today, a couple if we can, as we read through this. So summaries of the chapters three and four, while well, we are introduced to the McSwiney family who live by the tip, close to Tilly and Molly. Tilly and Teddy meet, and this is the beginning of their relationship that ends up being a romantic one. In chapter four, Tilly takes Molly to visit the town, uh, and many of the townspeople observe her attentively and quite cautiously as well. And we're also introduced to Irma Almanac, who uh, is the wife of the pharmacist, who we met in the previous chapter. But let's begin our reading. There was a gap in the McSwiney children after Barney. A pause. They had got used to him and decided there wasn't really much wrong, really, and started again fairly quickly. In all, there were now 11 McSwiney offspring. Teddy was May's firstborn, her dashing boy, cheeky, quick and canny. He ran a card game at the pub on a Thursday nights and two up on Fridays. Organised the Saturday night dances, was the SP bookie, that uh, is the bookmaker at the races, and owned all the sweeps on cup day and was first to raffle a chook if funds were needed by anyone for anything. They said Teddy McSwiney could sell a sailor seawater. He was Dungatar's highly valued full forward. He was charming, and nice girls loved him, but he was a McSwiney. Bueller Haradine said he was a bludger and a thief. Bueller, of course, being the town gossip. We get an idea here of um, the social status, though, of the McSwineys. They're at the very bottom end of society. They are the poor family. But Teddy has some status in the community because he's a very good football player. And we know from previously that football plays a really important role within this community. He was sitting on an old bus seat outside his caravan, cutting his toenails, looking up from time to time at the smoke drifting from Mad Molly's chimney. His sisters were in the middle of the yard, bobbing up and down over soap sud sheets, in an old bathtub that also served as a bathroom, a drinking trough for the horse, and, in summer, when the creek was low and leech-ridden, a swimming pool for the Littleys. May McSweeney, who is the mother of the family, flopped some sodden sheets over the telegraph wire slung between the caravans and spread them out, moving the pet galah sideways. She was a matter-of-fact woman who wore floral mumus and a pl- plastic flower behind her ear, round and neat with a scrubbed, freckled complexion. She took the pegs from her mouth and said to her eldest boy, You remember Myrtle Dunnage left town as a youngster when... I remember, said Teddy. We get this idea that the whole town remembers Tilly and the reason why she left, and that will be revealed a little bit later on in the text. Saw her yesterday, taking wheelbarrows full of junk down to the tip, said May. You speak to her? She doesn't want to speak to anyone. May went back to her washing. Fair enough. Teddy held his gaze to the hill. She's a nice looking girl, said May, but like I said, wants to keep to herself. I hear what you're saying, May. Is she crazy? Nope. But her mother is. Glad I don't have to run food up there anymore. I'm overworked as it is. You'll be off to get us a rabbit for tea now, Teddy boy. And again, a little hint here that May was actually looking after Molly when Tilly was away. She ran food up. So we get this idea again of a really caring woman. Now Teddy stood up and hooked his thumbs in his grey twill belt loops and inclined a little from the waist as if to walk off. He stood that way when he schemed, May knew. Elizabeth and Mary wrung a sheet, cord like fat toffee between them. Margaret took it from them and slapped the wet sheet into the wicker basket. Not fricassee rabbit again, Mum. Very well then, Princess Margaret. We'll see if your brother Teddy can find us a pheasant and a couple of truffles out there in the waste, or perhaps you'd like a nice piece of Venetian. As a matter of fact, I would, said Margaret. And Teddy emerged from the caravan with 22 slung over his shoulder. He went to the yard behind the veggie patch and caught two slimy golden ferrets, put them into a cage and set off. Three tiny Jack Russells at his heels. Teddy is a bit of a provider for the family. 
Notice that um, the McSwaney family, yes, they are called McSwaney. We get that sort of reference to swine. Um, a lot of them have quite royal names, you know, Margaret and, and Edward. Um, so just note that too. So just a little bit about the time period. So, of course, um, Queen Elizabeth II, her first visit to Australia, in fact, the first visit of any monarch to Australia happened in 1954. Around this time, this is set. Molly Dunnage woke to the sound of a fire crackling nearby and the possum thumping across the ceiling overhead. She wandered out to the kitchen, balancing against the wall. The thin girl was at the stove again, stirring poison in a pot. She sat in an old chair beside the stove and the girl held a bowl of porridge out to her. She turned her head away. Notice this is a third person narrative and this is from Molly's perspective. Hence, it's the thin girl and she and the girl. It's not Tilly. So again, we get an insight into Molly and the fact that she doesn't actually really know or isn't too aware of who Tilly is. It's not poison, said the girl. Everyone else has had some. Molly looked about the room, but no one else was there. What have you done to all my friends? They ate before you left, said Tilly, and smiled at Molly. There's just you and me now, Mum. How long are you staying? Until I decide to go. There's nothing here, said Molly. There's nothing anywhere. She put the bowl down in front of her mother. Molly scooped a spoonful of porridge and said, Why are you here? For peace and quiet, said the girl. Fat chance, said Molly, and flipped the spoonful of, pull, spoonful of porridge at her. It stuck like hot tar to Tilly's arm, burning and blistering. And now we move to Tilly's perspective. Tilly tied a hanky across her nose and mouth and stretched an empty onion sack over her large straw hat, then gathered it about her neck with a bit of string. She shoved her trouser legs into her socks and pushed the empty barrow down to the tip. She climbed down into the pit and searched through the sodden papers and fettered food scraps, the flies seething about her. She was wrestling with a half-submerged wheelchair when she heard a man's voice. We've got one of those at home. In full working order, you can have it. Tilly looked up at the young man. Three small brown and white dogs sat beside him. Listening, he held a cage of writhing ferrets and a gun and three dead rabbits dangled about his shoulders. He was a wiry bloke, not big, and wore his hat pushed back on his head. I'm Ted McSwiney, and you're Myrtle Tunnage, he smiled. He had straight white teeth. How do you know? I know a lot. Your mother, May, isn't it? Looked in on Molly from time to time, asked Tilly. From time to time. Tell her thanks. Tilly dug deeper, throwing fruit tins, doll's heads and bent bicycle wheels aside. You tell her when you collect the wheelchair, he called. And she went on digging. So you can come out of there now. That is, if you want to, he said. She stood inside, waving away the flies from her onion sack. Teddy watched her scramble up through the rubbish on the far side of the pit the side nearest the trench where his father emptied the night cans. He made his way around and was at the top of the bank when she got there. She straightened, looked up into Teddy's face and overbalanced. He grabbed her, steadied her, and they looked down into the bubbling brown pool. So uh, Teddy's father is the night cartman, so he empties out all the um, catchments of sewage every night. So he plays a quite an important role in the town, but again, it's one of low low status. She pulled free of him. You gave me a fright, she said. I'm the one should be frightened of you. Isn't that so? He winked, turned and whistled away along the bank. Yes, there is a bit of foreshadowing with this quotation. I won't spoil it, but this quotation, if you know how this text ends, is a really nice one. Now at home, Tilly tore off all her clothes and threw them into the flaving wood stone stove, then soaked in a hot bath for a very long time. She thought about Teddy McSwiney and wondered if the rest of the town would be as friendly. She was drying her hair by the fire when Molly tottered out from her room and said, You're back? Want a cup of tea? That'd be nice, said Tilly. You can make me one too, said Molly and sat down. She picked up the poker and prodded the burning kindling. See anyone you know at the tip, she sniggered. Tilly poured boiling water from the kettle into the teapot and got two mugs from the cupboard. This is a great quotation. Molly says, you can't, you can't keep anything secret here, said the old woman. Everybody knows everything about everyone, but no one ever tittle-tattles because then someone else will tell on them. But you don't matter. It's open slather on outcasts. A really good quotation to showcase this community being quite insular. So the fact that everyone knows everyone else's secrets, but they're not willing to share them, 
um, in case um, or worried about the repercussions because it'll bite them on the backside. This is a nice quotation as well to link with the crucible and the setting of Salem, where are there uh, you know wheels within wheels and fires within fires, um, a really insular community as well. So nice connection there between the towns of Salem and Dungatar. You're probably right, said Tilly, and poured them sweet black tea. In the morning, an ancient wheelchair of battered cane, cracked leather, and clanking steel wheels sat outside Tilly's back door. It was freshly scrubbed and reeked of dead oil. And that's where we end chapter three, which, as I said, begins a relationship between Teddy and Tilly. Chapter four. The next Saturday brought the match between Ithaca and Winyup. The winner would play Dungata in the grand final the following week. Those are the two um, closest communities or closest towns to Dungata. They're still a fair way away, actually, but they come up later on in the text as well, especially Winyup. Tilly Dunnage had maintained her industrious battle until the house was scrubbed and shiny and the cupboards bare, all the tin food eaten, and now Molly sat in the dappled sunlight at the end of the veranda in her wheelchair, the wisteria behind her just beginning to bud. Tilly tucked a tartan Ongaparinga rug over her mother's knees. There's a lot of Australiana in this um, little section, you know, the veranda, the wisteria, the Ongaparinga rug. Again, very, very famous um, brand back in the 1950s, 60s, even probably the 70s. I know your sort, said Molly, nodding and steepling her translucent fingers. As food had nourished her body and therefore her mind, some sense had returned to her. We see the consequences of Tilly's care for Molly. She starts to regain her strength. She realised she'd have to be crafty, employ stubborn resistance and subtle violence against this stronger woman who was determined to stay. Tilly smoothed Molly's wayward grey hair and slung her diddly bag over her shoulder pushed a large brimmed straw hat down on her head, put on dark glasses and pushed the chair off the veranda and over the buffalo tufts and yellow dandelions. At the gateposts, they paused and looked down. Yes, they are looking down on the town from up on the hill. This is a continual motif throughout the text. In the main street, the Saturday shoppers came and went or stood about in groups. Tilly drew breath and pushed on, showing her courage there. Molly held the wicker armrests and bellowed all the way to the bottom of the hill. So, so you are going to kill me, she cried. No, said Tilly, and wiped her sweaty palms on her trousers. The others were happy to let you die. I saved you. It's me they'll try to kill now. Again, um, we get this reference to something that had happened in the past and the fact that they're quite, or that the town wants to uh, exact revenge on Tilly. When they rounded the corner to the main street, they shop stopped again. Lois Pickett, fat and pimply, and Beulah Harradine, skinny and mean, were manning the Saturday morning street stall. What is it? asked Lois. It's a wheelchair, said Beulah. Someone pushing? Next door, Nancy stopped sweeping her footpath to peer at the figures rolling through the shadows and shine. It's her. It's that Myrtle Dunnage, the nerve, said Beulah. Well, 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 well. And man Molly, does Marigold know? No, said Beulah. Marigold doesn't know anything. I'd almost forgotten. How could you? The nerve of the girl. This'll be a treat. The hair. Not natural. They're coming. Look at the way this is written. It really does encapsulate that gossiping nature of the town, that inch of the nature of, of, of the town. Lois Harradine, her description is skinny and, and mean, is the town gossip. She wants to get into everyone else's business. In fact, that ends up backfiring on her in the end. There's also a reference to Marigold as well. Um, Marigold is the wife of um, the councilman Evan Pettyman, Marigold Pettyman, Pettyman. Um, and she plays a significant role as well, one that's quite similar to Tilly in terms of she's able to exact revenge on those who abused her, but we'll get to that a little bit later. The clothes. Ooh, shh. And the outcasts rolled towards them. Lois reached for her knitting and Beulah straightened the homemade jams. Tilly came to a stop with her knees pressed together to stop them shaking and smiled at the ladies in their elastic stockings and cardigans. Hello. Oh, you gave us a start, said Lois. If it isn't Molly, and this must be young Myrtle, back from... Where was it you went to, Myrtle? said Beulah, peering hard at Tilly's dark glasses. Away. How are you these days, Molly? asked Lois. No point complaining, said Molly. 
Molly studied the cakes and Tilly looked at the contents of the hamper. Tinned ham, spam, pineapple, peaches, a packet of TikToks, a Christmas pudding, Milo, Vegemite, and Raleigh's salve were all arranged in a wicker basket under red cellophane. The women studied Tilly. That's a raffle prize, said Lois, from Mr Pratt for the football club. Tickets are sixpence. I'll just have a cake, thank you. The chocolate sponge with coconut, said Tilly. No fear, not that one. We'll get Septicemia, said Molly. Lois folded her arms. Well? Beulah puckered her lips and raised her eyebrows. What about this one? asked Tilly, and bit her top lip to stop herself from smiling. Molly looked up at the brilliant sunshine, boring like hot steel rods through the holes in the corrugated iron veranda roof. The cream will be rancid. The jam rolls safest. How much? said Tilly. Two. Three shillings, said Lois, who had made the chocolate sponge and cast Molly a look that had started bush brush fire. Tilly handed over three shillings and Lois shoved the cake towards Molly, then recoiled. Tilly pushed her mother inside Pratt's. Daylight robbery, said Molly. That Lois Pickett scratches her scabs and blackheads then eats it from under her nails and she only puts coconut on her cake because of her dandruff. Calls herself a cleaner, does her at Almanac's house and you just wouldn't buy anything Bula Harradine made on principle, the type she is. Again, we see Molly's perspective of those townspeople. Now Muriel, Gertrude and Reg froze when Tilly wheeled Molly through the door. They stared as she picked over the sad fruit and vegetable selection and took some cereals from the shelves and handed them to her mother to nurse. When the two women moved to the haberdashery, Alvin Pratt rushed from his office. Tilly asked for three yards of green Georgette and Alvin said, certainly. So Muriel cut and wrapped the cloth and Alvin held the brown paper package to his chest and smiled broadly at Tilly. He had brown teeth. Such an unusual green. That's why it's dis- discounted. Still, if you're determined enough, you'll make something of it. A tablecloth, perhaps. Tilly opened her purse. First, you'll be settling your mother's unpaid account. His smile vanished and he offered one palm. Again, we get this idea of Alvin, even though he's not in the upper echelon of the society, he likes the control and power he has because he knows about everyone's accounts. So even over the Beaumonts, he has control of that. They owe him money. Therefore, he has that little bit of power and same here at this moment. Molly studied her fingernails until he paid. Outside, Molly jerked her thumb back and said, trumped up little merchant. They headed for the chemist. Pearl, barefoot and hosing the path, turned to stare as they passed. Fred was down in the cellar, and as the hose swept over the open trapdoors, he yelled and his head popped up at footpath level. He too watched the women pass. Nancy stopped sweeping to stare. Notice this continual theme as well as well of all the townspeople staring at Tilly or watching her or observing her. Mr. Almanac was behind his cash register. Good morning, said Tilly, to his round pink head. Good day, he mumbled to the floor. I need a serum or purgative. I'm being poisoned, cried Molly. Mr. Almanac's bald dome shifted to form corrugations. It's Molly Dunnage, I'm still alive. What about that poor wife of yours? Irma is as well as can be expected, said Mr. Almanac. How can I help you? Nancy Pickett came through the doorway, carrying her broom. She was a square-faced woman with broad shoulders and a boyish gait. She used to sit behind Tilly at school, tease her, dip her plat into the inkwell, and follow her home to help the other kids bash her up. Nancy was always a good fighter, and would happily flatten anyone who picked on her big brother Bobby. She looked straight at Tilly. What are you after? It's in my food, whispered Molly loudly. Nancy leaned down towards her. She puts it in my food. Nancy nodded knowingly. Right. She took some DeWitts and acid from the table nearby and held it under Mr. Almanac's face. Mr. Almanac raised his veiny hand, patted his fingertips over the cash register keys and pressed down hard. There was a crash, clash, a ring and a thunk, and Mr. Almanac wheezed. That'll be sixpence. Tilly paid Mr. Almanac, and, as she passed, Nancy, she said in a low murmur, if I do decide to kill her, I'll probably break her neck. Pearl, Fred, Alvin, Muriel, Gertrude, Beulah, and Lois, and all the Saturday morning shoppers and country folk, watched the illegitimate girl push her mad mother 
loose woman and hag across the road and into the park. That's the way they judge her and label her. And we know from the Crucible that many of the characters too are judged for certain things. So in this case, um, we find out that she's an illegitimate girl, that Tilly doesn't know who her father is, um, and that Molly is a loose woman. The fact that she gave birth to a child before she was married. And again, we know this is a really conservative community. And as a result, these things go against them. Similar to say characters like maybe Tichuba or Sarah Good, who are the first ones to be labelled witches in the society of Salem because they are vulnerable, so too are these women. They don't abide by the social conventions, therefore they get picked upon and get labelled with these phrases. Something's burning my back, said Molly. You should be used to it by now, said Tilly. They walked to the creek and stopped to watch some ducklings struggling after their mother against a mild torrent and a flotilla of twigs. They passed Irma Almanac, framed by her roses, warming her bones in the sunlight at the front gate. A stiff, faded form with a loud knee rug and knuckles like ginger roots. The disease that crippled Mrs. Almanac was, was rheumatoid arthritis. Her face was lined with pain. Some days, even breathing caused her dry bones to grate and her muscles to fill with fire. She could predict rain coming, sometimes a week ahead, so it was a handy barometer for farmers. They often confirmed with Irma what the corns on their toes indicated. Her husband did not believe in drugs. Addictive, he said. All that's needed is God's forgiveness, a cleaned mind and a wholesome diet, plenty of red meat and well-cooked vegetables. It's interesting that her husband is a pharmacist, but he does not believe in drugs. We get the idea here that he, and we'll find out later on anyway, that he does abuse her, um, and he treats her quite awfully. Now, Irma dreamed of moving through time like oil on water. She longed for a life without pain, and the bother of her bent husband stuck fast in a corner of hounding her about sin, the cause of all disease. Again, this idea about being a conservative community. We know that earlier on he called Faith O'Brien a sinner after he saw photos of her in an adulterous position. And again, he has these really strong Christian values about sinning and about suffering. And he has this really vitriolic, um, punitive form of justice that he likes to inflict on the community. Um, not just his wife, but those other community members as well. You've always had lovely roses, said Molly. How come? Irma lifted her eyebrows to the petals above, but did not open her eyes. Molly Dunnage, she said. Yes. Molly reached over and prodded Irma's bruised and kidney-shaped fist. Irma winced, drew her breath in sharply. Still hurts, does it? A little, she said, and opened her eyes. How are you, Molly? Awful, but I'm not allowed to complain. What's wrong with your eyes? Arthritis in them today, she smiled. You're in a wheelchair too, Molly. It suits my captor, said Molly. Tilly leaned down to look at her and said, Mrs. Almanac, my name is... I know who you are, Myrtle. Very good of you to come home to your mother. Very brave too. Yeah, she does get called brave. I really like that as a quotation. You've been sending food all these years. Don't mention it. Irma cast a warning look towards the chemist shop. I wouldn't want to mention it either. You're a terrible cook, said Molly. She grinned slyly at Irma. Your husband's mighty slow these days. How did you manage that? Tilly placed an apologetic hand, lighter than pollen, on Mrs. Almanac's cold, stony shoulder, and Irma smiled. Percival says God is responsible for everything. She used to have a lot of falls, which left her with a black eye or a cut lip. Over the years, as her husband grand to a stiff and shuffling old man, her injuries ceased. So we get a hint here that she was in, a, in an abusive relationship. And she's not the only one in the town who is, by the way, either. And it's interesting to know that they sort of get on here. Um, they have that shared um, experience of being abused. And we'll learn about um, Molly a little bit later on. Now, Irma glanced over at the shoppers on the other side of the street. They stood in lines, staring over at the three women talking. Again, this idea of staring. Tilly bade her farewell, and they continued along the creek towards home. With Molly safely parked at the fireside, Tilly sat on her veranda and rolled herself a cigarette. Down below, again she's looking down at the, at, um, the town. 
So down below, the people bobbed together like chooks, pecking at the vegetable scraps, turning occasionally to glance up at the house on the hill before turning hurriedly away, showing their fear of Tilly. All right, let's look at some key quotations. The first one is about Teddy. He was Dungatar's highly valued full forward. He was charming and nice girls loved him, but he was a McSwaney. Bueller Haradine said he was just a bludger and a thief. And he is labelled as a McSwaney. He is in the lower class of the community, even though um, he plays a really important role on the football team. In fact, he's the best player in the football team. He can't shake that status within in the town. The next quotation. You can't keep anything secret here. Everybody knows everything about everyone, but no one ever tittle-tattles because then someone else will tell on them. But you don't matter. It's open slather on outcasts. A few parts to this quotation. The first one is, yes, that everyone, everybody knows everything about everyone in this inch of the community, um, just like in Salem in the, the Crucible. But no one ever tells um, or shares other people's secrets. They keep them to themselves because of fear of the repercussions. But... That doesn't matter to outcasts like Tilly. So people are happy to spread rumours and secrets about Tilly and Molly because they're outcasts. And the last quotation. She used to have a lot of falls which left her with a black eye and a cut lip. And over the years, as her husband ground to a stiff, shuffling old man, her injuries ceased. And this quotation refers to Irma Almanac and her abusive husband. We'll find out later on throughout the text. There are a number of men who abuse their wives or who abuse women and it's part of that again that conservative patriarchal community of Dungatar. 